you can be a really smart, ambitious professional and also be as queer and weird and different as you want. Hi, you're listening to the QT Podcast, where we break down barriers, celebrate successes, and discuss actionable strategies for queer professionals to succeed and lead in the tech ecosystem. My name's Day Courtney, my pronouns are they, them, and I'm the producer of the QT Podcast. Thank you so much for listening. Queer people are leaving a significant mark on the tech industry and roles like leaders, founders, key creatives, essential technologists, to name a few. Despite the unspoken societal and business rules that sometimes seem to work against them. And they've been doing this for years. That's why in this episode, we're celebrating the resilience and achievements of queer people in tech by spotlighting some of the incredible contributions and achievements, while also delving into the critical importance of psychological safety at work. We'll break down some actionable steps that companies and queer people can take for themselves to work towards manifesting more inclusive and supportive work environments. Because if queer people have been making an impact this large while swimming upstream, then can you imagine what's possible when they're really able to shine? An inclusive future where the norm is feeling safe and supported at work, especially for 2 LGBTQ plus folks, is definitely a worthwhile goal. Because how we feel at work can significantly shape our career. The sense of respect and acceptance one feels is not just beneficial, but essential for thriving professionally. We're going to hear from queer tech community members about their experiences at work and share some key findings from our industry report on queer people's experiences in tech to validate what they share, provide some deeper insights, and take a step towards building a roadmap for queer professionals in tech. We'll also take a look at how community and mentorship impact career development and the role of employee resource groups, also known as ERGs, within companies alongside external organizations like Queer Tech and other initiatives, can create spaces for acceptance and community and help turn queer professionals into queer leaders. And finally, stick around to the end as we listen to how one queer professional participated in unlocking their company's resources for significant gender-affirming care for employees and their dependents. It's really quite something, so do please listen to the end. That story is an incredible example of how when queer individuals hold leadership roles and wield influence within their organizations, large or small, they can really make a difference. So let's kick it off by jumping into a conversation that I had with Laura B. McDonald's at the Queer Tech Conference about the professional experiences of queer people. My name is Laura B. McDonald. People either call me Laura or LB, and I am a CPA, so a chartered professional accountant. Ta-da. I am a controller at Courage, which is a social impact startup. And I am also a board member with Queer Tech. I am currently the treasurer. And I've been the treasurer for the last six years. The world feels really disconnected sometimes, especially for people who work in tech in a remote world where we're so far apart sometimes. And when you are queer or trans or two-spirit working in any company, whether it's in tech or honestly any other domain, sometimes your feeling of solitude is doubled because maybe you feel siloed in your department, but then you also feel like nobody else understands your reality outside of work. There's so much of the world that is just assumed that everyone's life follows certain narratives and certain rules that doesn't necessarily apply to queer and trans people. At work, psychological safety matters. And one measure of commonality for queer people is whether or not, and to what degree, someone considers themselves to be out at their workplace. Now, being out can mean a lot of different things across a lot of different intersections for a lot of different people. But one thing that we can ask people is that in collaborative settings with colleagues, how comfortable or how normal does it feel to share about one's personal life? When the QT research team asked their participants, all members of the 2 LGBTQ plus community, to what extent they consider themselves to be out at work, there were some promising results. With 74.7% of the respondents describing themselves to be at least somewhat out of work, however, 25% of the respondents described themselves to be not out at work. 
Unfortunately, how safe one feels at work can really impact their careers. We can think of being out as a measure of authenticity. And when we don't feel like we're able to be authentic around our colleagues, it makes sense that queer people could feel isolated in these situations. Now, I just want to step back to say there's very good reasons why a lot of queer people are not out at work or the degree to which they're out at work is very little. And that can have a lot to do with privilege and the field that you're working in and the environment you're working in. Ultimately, people prioritize their own safety, which is extremely important for the queer community. And not all queer experiences are the same. At the QT conference, I spoke with Florencia Haravega, and when we connected, we spoke about how when you feel demographically isolated in a situation, that it can impact the types of projects that you do and the type of career trajectory that you find yourself on. I'm Florencia Haravega. Flo is shorter and easier. Uh, my pronouns are she, her, and I have a sort of strange job, uh, which has two hats uh, and is very long to say, so I'm just going to go for it. Um, so I am a partner and CTO for Alley Corp, which is a New York City based uh, early stage VC and venture studio. And my role there is primarily sort of operational, uh, advising some of the other partners who do investment on technology, helping with some of the, the work that goes into starting new companies in the venture studio side and, um, and then advising the portfolio. And then uh, I'm also a CEO of Alley Corp Nord, which is a consultancy based in Montreal and I live in Montreal. And I basically run that. <laughs> so that's that's my my extremely long business card. Being queer has always been a huge part of my life. I'm an elder millennial and I came out for the first time when I was 11. So <laughs> it's been a journey. I think being queer has affected my career in countless ways, all of which are probably fairly subtle. So I think uh, one of the things that has certainly happened is that I have pressed the eject button out of situations many times because they were not, um, they were not welcoming. They were not, I was just very uncomfortable in that way that one becomes uncomfortable when one is demographically very uh, different from everyone else. I think I've bailed on a bunch of things for that reason. And I think that has been extremely influential in my career maybe in some ways because of missed opportunities, but I actually don't think of that as the primary effect. I think of it more as I was set on a path towards entrepreneurship because I was wanting to get out of situations where I was held down and held back and, and like I couldn't bring myself to work. And so I decided, okay, well, I'm just going to work for myself. Uh, let's see how that goes. And, and, you know, I haven't always worked for myself. I don't currently work for myself, but having taken that path at various points in my life, I think has been extremely important in my career. And, and that's basically what I've built my career on as an entrepreneur, as a technologist, manager, leader, all of those things. Part of that has been really driven by the fact that there were spaces that I didn't feel comfortable in and I wanted to get out of them. When we consider all of these insights around safety, respect, and the sometimes solitary and challenging experiences that queer professionals navigate in their careers, it prompts us to ask, where do we go from here? Returning to the QT research, we uncovered a pressing need for enhanced community support, resources, and job connections. At QueerTech, we believe that the solution lies in robust community and mentorship programming. So you can learn more about our programs and events at QueerTech.org. I just want to go back to the QT conference where I had this really great conversation with Sam Andre, the managing director of the dais, and he shared his thoughts about the role of queer community. My name is Sam Andre. I use he, him pronouns. I am the managing director of the Dais, which is a think tank at Toronto Metropolitan University that works on uh, public policy issues. As queer people, there's a tendency to, you know, want to fit in, to sort of hide who you are when you're part of, especially, I think, larger organizations and companies um, or where you're maybe one of the only uh, queer people like on your team or on, on in your um, organization. And so this is an opportunity to sort of unshackle that, uh, be together and be open and honest about um, the challenges facing, you know, our community in particular and how they intersect with with challenges more broadly, I think. So uh, I think it's really important to create, you know, these safe spaces, not just for queer people, but, you know, like all marginalized communities uh, deserve spaces where they can, you know, be themselves and, and tackle their community's issues. Community building initiatives are key to unlocking potential. 
offering a holistic approach that includes things like boosting confidence, aiding skill development, supporting career transitions, connections with industry leaders, and accessing specialized resources and learning opportunities. With queer-led and industry-supported actions, we can forge a path forward towards a tech industry that's not only more inclusive, but also fundamentally more equitable. At queer tech events, such as the QD Conference, our largest annual two-day event, where in 2023, we welcomed over 500 attendees for 78 sessions in Montreal, Quebec, and of course, with a virtual option. Side note, our next QDQ is coming up in the fall, so be sure to join our digital community at queertech.org and follow along. Hi, cuties. I'm Inel Felt, the CEO and co-founder of QueerTech, and my pronouns are he, him. QueerTech is a nonprofit organization dedicated to promoting workforce and economic development across Canada by fostering entrepreneurship and providing opportunities for the 2SLGBTQ plus community to access professional development, networking, and mentorship in the tech industry. Our primary goal is to increase access to these opportunities and support the growth and advancement of queer professional, entrepreneurs, and innovators in order to build a strong and more diverse workforce that is better equipped to meet the needs of the innovation economy. By promoting diversity and inclusion, we believe we can help businesses access a broader range of talent and perspective, and we can drive innovation, creativity, and growth. Become a QT today at queertech.org. Now let's just jump back into our conversations with Laura and with Flo to hear what they had to say about queer community events. It feels good to have an organization where we can connect across domains. A remote world sometimes feels so siloed and alone, and it feels really good to step out of that and get to be with other people. Create little islands where your worlds can intersect, where you can be, you know, a really smart, ambitious professional and also be as queer and weird and different as you want amongst your people, it kind of makes your world feel a little less fractured. It's about sense-making in the world, in a world that often doesn't make a lot of sense. <laughs> I think that that spaces like QTQ and queer community events in, in professional circles, whether tech or not, are extremely important because, first of all, they give us role models. They also, if we're more senior, they give us people to mentor. They just give us this place to feel whole. And I think that that is extremely powerful, recharging our energy and, and giving us the ability to go into spaces that are maybe less comfortable, more hostile, whatever, and have a full battery with which to advocate or just be whatever you want to be without being completely drained. And so I think that's immensely powerful. And I think they're also a great place for finding people who are similar to you in various ways. You know, like I have lots of queer friends, many of whom are not at all in tech. And there's an amazing intersection of the types of humor that we can arrive at when we have queerness overlapping with whether it's, you know, programming humor or whether it's it's things about the, the tech industry more as a business or, or all of the above. There's a joy in finding people who understand the same things as you. There's joy to be found in, in difference in not being in your comfort zone and, and sharing something new with people. But there is that sense of sort of coming home and of finding your people, the people who are kind of most similar to you in various respects and then finding ways that you can collaborate with them over time and in other contexts. It's important to underscore the significance of queer professional communities within the tech sector, both external to corporations and within, often taking the shape as employee resource groups, also known as ERGs. But before we delve deeper, let's clarify a little bit about what ERGs really are. ERGs are often voluntary, employee-led groups that serve as a resource for the members of that group and the organization. They do this by fostering a diverse and inclusive workplace. When I was working at Employer Brand at Shopify, I learned about the ERG there through my teammates. I met lots of people who I still consider my friend today. So, you know, obviously, shout out to the friends that I've met through Shopify ERG that I continue to see at queer tech events to this day. So next, I want to talk through some of the recommendations that a report actually makes for industries 
Because one, if you're a queer person within your company, it could be helpful to hear what our recommendations are. And two, if you're in a policy, leadership, HR, or talent role in your organization, I think that these recommendations could also be helpful as some indicators for what could contribute to building a healthy work environment for your queer teammates. Queer people sometimes find themselves either unaware or skeptical about an organization's resources that are available to them. This skepticism isn't unfounded either. There's a number of studies from 2015 to 2017 that shed light on a crucial gap in communication and trust between the 2SLGBTQ plus community and their employers. Addressing this gap really requires a multifaceted approach. Solutions could include actively involving queer people in the decision-making process regarding the adoption of a company's queer-friendly policies. This type of inclusion helps ensure that the policies are not just symbolic, but effectively address the needs and concerns of the queer community within tech organizations. But of course, the queer community and these organizations shouldn't bear the bulk of this work all on their own. There's a number of really, really great DEI consultancy firms that companies can work with. And this is especially important to support those who are facing more severe disparities, such as transgender, gender nonconforming, and Black, Indigenous, and people of color communities. This support is critical. And if we want to address issues of queer engagement within organizations, communication really matters. It's essential for companies to make their employees aware of their supportive policies and resources right from the start, although awareness alone isn't enough. Organizations should also constantly demonstrate their commitment to social justice and inclusivity, and this commitment can be showcased through their actions, policies, and how they engage with both internal and external queer professional communities. The existence of queer professional communities such as queer tech and ERGs within tech companies is more than just a formality. These communities are a lifeline for many queer individuals navigating their careers. These groups can provide a sense of belonging, mentorship, and support that can really improve the professional and personal experiences of their members. They also play a crucial role in advocating for change, pushing companies to not only adopt inclusive policies, but also to live by them. This influence can help the tech industry become a beacon of diversity, inclusion, and equality. Through these efforts, we can move closer to a future where every individual, irrespective of their sexual orientation or gender identity, has the opportunity to succeed and lead in the tech world. Now I'd like to return to a guest that we had in season one of the QT podcast, Dr. Devin Cronish. If you haven't listened to it, go back and check it out. In this interview with Dr. Devin Cronish, they break down the three things that you need to build an ERG at your company. I tend to be this person that if there isn't a DEI council, I'll found one. Or if there is one by day two, I'm normally in. It's literally a running joke in my life at this point. You cannot have a DEI council do anything unless there are three things right there. You need to have the lived experience on it so the folks on the council can't be your outgroup, your majority outgroup that is going to do it for the poor minority group. You need to have the experience in how to lead these things. You shouldn't have folks that have no experience in facilitating workshops be put in a position, hey, I'm the only person here who can speak to us, so I guess now I'm going to do it. Because that is just tokenizing. It's working off free labor as per usual. And then the third one, which tends to be the challenge I run into, is you have to have power on those. You can have the most beautiful, diverse experience, lived experience on it. You can have top facilitators, trainers, coaches, whatnot on this group. If you don't actually have the ability to push the decisions you make through, you might just as well save everybody the time and effort. Now, those three things that you need for an ERG, according to Dr. Devin Cronish, make a lot of sense to me. You need to have people with lived experience running the ERG. And you need those folks to have experience and facilitation, I would add, there's always the possibility for growth. So if people are getting involved and no one has experience, then there's an opportunity there to push for some support from your leadership to get that training and to level up in your facilitation skill set. Also, the third thing, which is definitely the most important and the hardest to come by, which is power and influence within your organization. And when all of these things really come together and an ERG is really vibrant and successful, like it is in so many great companies, but not all, um, it can have a really positive experience on people who are coming into the company. 
So I want to just take a quick second to listen to Jay Young, who is earlier in their career, on their experience of what it was like to join an organization that had a fully functional ERG with a vibrant community. Here's Jay. Hi, my name is Jay. My pronouns are she, they. I'm a social media specialist at Well Simple, and I'm a passionate hobbyist. When I started at the company I work at now, it was actually my first time starting in like a more professional and corporate role. So to start there and immediately have access to a Pride ERG was incredibly um, influential for me and helped me grow quite a bit. And I'm actually now at the point where I get to give back and I'm now leading that Pride ERG. So it's been like a really beautiful full circle moment for me. I think it's really important for people to be able to see themselves in the places that they're trying to go, like in the roles that they're trying to achieve. And when you create the communities where people can help each other improve, I think that visibility becomes so much easier to see. Psychological safety in the workplace means creating an environment where individuals feel safe to express themselves without fear or negative consequences, and it's foundational. Psychological safety allows for the authentic expression of one's identities, fostering a culture of openness and innovation. Respect and acceptance from colleagues and management are not just ethical imperatives, but also crucial factors that influence career trajectories. They contribute to a sense of belonging and motivation, directly impacting job satisfaction and professional growth. When we think about the conversation with Florencia Haravega, who is an industry leader, experienced situations that she wanted to depart because of how she was feeling within them. Now, the role of community and mentorship for queer professionals cannot be overstated. They provide essential networks for support, guidance, and opportunities for both personal and professional development. And for queer individuals, I really like what Flo said earlier about feeling like coming home. It's an opportunity to connect with people that you really, really align with in your interests and your careers, but also your lived experience, which can be a rare opportunity for queer people working in tech. For organizations to build really meaningful solutions, we'll go back to our earlier recommendation, working with a range of several organizations, especially with populations who are facing the most severe disparities with lives at the intersections of many different identities. And I want to highlight the specific challenges faced by transgendered people in the workplace as issues related to hormones, lack of resources for appropriate restrooms, and the pervasive ignorance and stigma. This underscores the urgency for targeted solutions. These include specific measures to support transgender and gender norm conforming workers, recognizing name changes, including trans health care and benefits, and providing accessible gender neutral washrooms. Additionally, diversity training tailored to help employees better support trans and gender non conforming colleagues is critical, encompassing diversity workshops, listening to trans voices, and respecting pronouns, of course. By implementing these solutions and fostering a culture that values psychological safety, respect, community mentorship, and inclusive leadership, organizations can not only enhance their career trajectories for queer individuals, but also set the stage for systemic changes that benefit the wider tech industry and society as a whole. This positive cycle where queer professionals evolve into queer leaders who champion transformative changes shows us a path towards a more inclusive, equitable, and diverse future for the tech industry. So I want to go back for one last interview where I had the great pleasure of chatting with Sam Naylor, someone who definitely exemplifies the impact of visible queer leadership and the impact that one can have to improve things for the 2SLGBTQ plus community and more inside of a company and how these improvements have the potential for a ripple effect into the wider tech industry. Here's Sam. Hi, I'm Sam Naylor. I'm a trans man. My pronouns are he, him. I'm currently on the board of directors for Queer Tech, and for my day job, I work at Deloitte as a chief of staff. I'm also the National Pride ERG co-chair. March of this year, I came out as being trans. I've transitioned back in 2016, but went into the closet due to just some of the stressors of being an out trans man where I was working at the time. And it wasn't until March of this year that I felt confident doing that because I had Influenced some pretty significant policy change at my company. We now have $100,000 worth of gender affirming healthcare benefits for any employee, their spouse, or their dependent by default. You don't have to pay for insurance. It's just included in your role at Deloitte. Once that had launched and had been successful and I'd built a lot of executive relationships at the company, I felt much more confident being out as a trans person because there are challenges, but it helps to know that you have people in your corner that are senior enough and also educated or open enough to help you navigate those challenges. And to give you a bit more context, my first couple of years at the company, the company's great uh, by and large. However, 
Um, sometimes you run into leaders that are a bit more challenging to work with from an acceptance perspective. And I had a rough go. I'll just say that that's when I went back into the closet. I am very proud of who I am outside of work and inside of work. It took a bit of time for me to have confidence and know that enough support. I've always wanted to do these types of speaking engagements, but it wasn't until recently that I was ready to navigate any of the challenges that might come along with it in my professional workspace. I've always been quite creative in terms of thinking and experiencing things outside of the box. I got into my top artistic design program and was encouraged to go into business by one of my parents for practicality reasons. I think that that ultimately impacted my journey of understanding or accepting myself as a queer person because business is historically rather conservative. It's changing. And so I think for me, being queer caused me to be like a super hard worker because I knew there was something different about myself and I was scared about what might happen to my future if I accepted that part of myself. And so I wanted to prove to everybody that I was okay, that I was good, that I was strong. And it ended up giving me a lot of independence financially, which gave me the space to leave parts of my life behind, you could say, that didn't fully nourish my full identity. And so from a career perspective, at the beginning of my career, it kind of pigeonholed me into something I don't like. I had to continually pivot to get back to that sense of authenticity and creativity. And I've had probably seven or eight different jobs. And I graduated in 2012 and it's now 2023. So it's every couple of years I'm shifting. And so I'd say being queer caused me to take a lot more time to discover myself as a professional because I was constantly hiding and trying to hide behind a certain persona of being professional. And so it's made me a super hard worker, very gritty, but I have also been overly serious because I haven't been able to be myself. And I think now as I'm gradually coming into myself, I think what I'm doing is trying to turn, I like the idea of turning capitalism on its head in the sense that if you're in the system, you can change the system in a different way than activists can who maybe are more from an outside perspective. And so being at Deloitte, while I may have had some challenging experiences, I used that to find executive sponsors who could understand the problem and wanted to change the problem and made some significant policy change. And we're doing other really cool things like we're creating an, an immigration support program. We, we have, um, we're mandating in-person allyship training for every individual in the company, which is a 15,000 person company. That's not yet launched, but these are all initiatives that are underway that weren't previously. Things about fertility as well, which is not just impacting queer people, but almost anybody really, a lot of people have uh, potential for that to be something they struggle with. So I'm really trying to figure out, although the system I'm in isn't perfect, what can I do to make it better? And so from a career perspective, I'm starting to be recognized as a really strong, innovative change maker for a better culture within the company. And not only that, I have an opportunity to mentor people from underprivileged backgrounds. Maybe they're at a company like Deloitte where not a lot of people look like them. And so how do they show up as themselves and how do I help them use their voice, right? And so for me, my career shifted into something that felt like I was hiding into something where I'm trying really hard to push the boundaries of what does a professional look like, talk like, exist like, what's their identity? And I want to use my voice, hence why I'm doing this interview, hence why I was chose to speak from a professional perspective, it's it's evolved over time. How do I allow other queer people to access the type of job I have? Not that everybody wants to do it and have a ripple effect because Deloitte's pretty well respected. So when you think about Deloitte implementing gender affirming healthcare benefits, $100,000 for each employee, that means like a lot of other peer companies like maybe KPMG, PwC, it can take time for it to ripple across, but they set a standard and not just a standard for consulting companies, but tech companies. Like they're a research leader in a lot of their publications. So while I'm in a system that's not perfect, what can I do to make it better without completely like leaving the system, right? Yeah. I think that's a really great question for us all to ask ourselves as we navigate the tech industry. While the system's not perfect, what is it that we can do to make it better? It's clear that the strength of the 2 LGBTQ plus community bolstered by allyship, mentorship, and inclusive leadership is reshaping the tech industry. It's a reminder that diversity isn't just about representation, it's about creating environments where everyone can be their authentic selves, where innovation thrives on different perspectives, and where every individual has the opportunity to lead and to inspire. So before we sign off, a heartfelt thank you to all our guests for sharing their experiences, the queer tech team for their never-ending advocacy and to the queer tech community for bringing in your stories to our events and onto this podcast. And next time on the QT podcast, we're deep diving on the hiring process, so definitely tune in. This podcast is supported by Google Chrome and the Canadian Media Fund.